On February 18, 1930, Elm Farm Ollie became the world's most famous cow that hadn't been falsely accused of burning Chicago down. Prior to that day, Nellie J, as she was sometimes called, had merely been a remarkable cow, a two-year-old Guernsey who gave, according to reports, prodigious amounts of milk. At a time when your typical Guernsey bred specifically for the quality and quantity of their milk gave about four gallons of milk a day at two milkings, Nellie gave six across three, which was probably enough to make any cow feel special, inasmuch as cows can feel special. Anyway, it's doubtful that Nellie knew what was going to happen to her on that particular February day in 1930. Normally, she spent her days eating, sleeping, and chewing cud in between milkings at the Sunny Mead Farms in Bismarck, Missouri. And you know, now that we come to mention it, we're not sure why she was ever called Elm Farm Ollie. Maybe it was her maiden name. Along came some folks and loaded her up into a vehicle, and before you get all worked up about where this might be headed, let us just say she survived the trip just fine, and nothing horrible befell her at the end of it. She gets to keep being a cow afterwards, instead of steaks, so no worries there. As things got moving, the ride was probably pretty bumpy and noisy at first, but this would have settled down pretty quickly and smoothed out, at least until the end. Which is good because the people on that ride with her wanted to try an experiment, and after a while, as they neared St. Louis, Missouri, one fella, especially picked for the job, got out a stool and a milk pail and took up position to one side of Nellie. Soon enough, he was engaged in milking Nellie as they both rode along. The reports say that Nellie was extra especially productive that day. As they traveled along, she produced 24 quarts of milk over the course of the 72-minute ride. An impressive feat by all accounts, but what happened to those quarts is probably the more extraordinary thing. You see, other people were on board, and as the quarts came out of Nellie, they were quickly packaged up in little paper cartons. Then little bits of cloth and string were attached to the cartons, and the whole kit and caboodle was thrown out the door of the moving vehicle. People waiting outside along the route had to scramble to get some of Nellie's milk, but those 24 quarts all found willing takers including the famous Charles Lindbergh. By the time Nellie and her milker arrived at their destination, such a big crowd had gathered to see her and maybe get some of that milk that Nellie and her fellow passengers had to be detoured. Which was kind of a problem, because in 1930 there weren't a lot of places you could land a Ford Trimotor airplane with a cow on board, and the International Aircraft Exposition at St. Louis had most of them in use. But land they did, and not only did Nellie J become the first cow to fly in an airplane, but also the first cow to be milked while flying in an airplane. And 90 years later, the event is still celebrated on February 18th in Wisconsin, for reasons we presume. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The modern cow is quite the marvel of production. Over the thousands of years that we humans have been aware of and taking advantage of the cow, we've increased its ability to produce milk, meat, and leather at least fivefold. Modern cows are bigger, heavier, and more robust than they ever have been previously. All so that they can keep up with our demands for things like big steaks, tall glasses of milk, tasty cheese, and fancy wallets. It wasn't always like this, of course. Back about 11,000 years ago, we didn't know from cows. Or more properly, we didn't know from cattle, because that's the actual name of that collection of critters with horns and hooves that stand in pastures mooing at you. Cattle. And cattle is one of those weird words that's no singular form. It's a word that always refers to the plural, which means grammatically, it's really awkward to talk about having one cattle. You could have one head of cattle, which is only slightly better, or you could do what we humans have actually done and refer to individual members of cattle by the name of the most common member of the group, the cow. Which is, of course, the name of female cattle, and there are always more cows than bulls. So strictly speaking, a bunch of cows, cows and bulls included, is a collection of cattle, the collective noun for which is herd. So you have a herd of cattle. To which we can only reply, yes, have a you herd of horses. The reason we ended up in that weird situation and with that awful punchline is because of the way English tends to assault other languages until all the good words fall out. 
Once they're all on the ground, English picks them up, takes them home, pins them up on the walls, and connects them with bits of colored string as if reconstructing the crime. And what we find out after this particular reconstruction is that cattle never meant, well, those mooing things. And here's where things get complicated linguistically, legally, and financially. The Romans had a word in Latin that meant head, and that word, spelled with a C, was caput. Spell it with a K and you have a word that means essentially broken, which is a word from German that came from French and used to mean the inability to take a trick in a specific card game called piquet. Clearly not the word we're interested in. Caput with a C, as we said, meant head. That form of the word remains with us today in the phrase per capita, or for each head. Now take that word and let it simmer for a few years in a broth, along with chopped up bits of Latin word forms, the fall of the Roman Empire, regional dialects, and more, and it comes out in medieval Latin as the word capitale, which by then means a principal sum of money, and from which the present day word capital comes from, in reference to ready cash, net worth, and importantly, a stock of accumulated goods. Capitale was also used in reference to a place where the head of government can be found, as in the state capital. Honestly, we're trying to take this slowly so no one gets lost along the way, which is why we aren't right now diving into things about capital letters, architecture, and the other half dozen meanings of the word capital. Then a bunch of history happens in and around England. Eventually the Normans turn up in 1066, and Anglo-Norman French takes over from Old English, where the Anglo-Saxons already have a word they use to refer to cattle, pheo. Except in saying it meant cattle, what we mean is that it referred to things that would be referred to as cattle down the road, not that it had the same meaning as the word cattle had at the time. We'll explain better in a second. Fio is still used today for the other thing it meant, property, in the word fee. The point being, the Anglo-Saxon word fio gives way to the new Anglo-Norman word for this whole mess, cattell. And the thing to point out here, before we get to the etymological end of all of this, is that cattell still doesn't really mean cows. What it really means, and the reason for all the hemming and hawing about which words meant what and having to trace all this stuff around like this, what it really means is personal property, especially livestock of any kind that could be moved around easily. Back then, cattell, and therefore it's later respelling cattle, could as easily mean sheep, pigs, goats, horses, or any other animal a person would raise except chickens. Chickens were sold as part of the land, so chickens were, along with the land, considered real property as opposed to personal property, or if you prefer, a person's real estate. We also got the word chattel from cattle, which also meant a unit of personal property and later came to refer to slaves, held by people as a piece of property. Finally, to put all this to bed and to stave off the folks who are a little too familiar with Vampire the Masquerade, let's deal with the word cow itself in brief. Cow comes from the Anglo-Saxon coo, which plurals to chi and genuinely means a bovine animal. When Anglo-Saxon meets Middle English, chi, instead of being spelled cy, becomes ki and is then additionally pluraled by adding an e to the end of it, giving the word Kine. Which means, in a literal sense, more than one, more than one cow. Obviously a clan plot to make everyone sound silly. Basically, it is by mutual agreement that the word cattle, if given no other context, refers specifically to members of the bovine family. Which comes from the Latin bovinus. Which becomes biof in Anglo-French. Which then became beef in Middle English which just means either a full-grown cow or the meat of a full-grown cow. So it would be perfectly proper to call an adult cattle a beef, and a group of them beeves. Sorry, we're done now. Promise. Obviously, over the course of 11,000 years of history, the language we use to talk about cattle has undergone nearly as many changes in usage and definition as the cow itself. In fact, there are well over 1,000 different kinds of cows in the world, and each has been bred to a specific purpose depending on where they live and what is needed from them. Amazingly, though, 
of those 1,000 other varieties of cattle, as diverse and different looking as they all are from one another, most seem to share just 80 common ancestors, and they all trace their ancestry back to one particular species of animal. Dungeons and Dragons first mentioned the Aurochs in Dragon Magazine issue 137 from September of 1988 as part of an article titled Into the Age of Mammals by David Howery. In the article, Howery attempts to fill in some of the holes regarding beasts of the Cenozoic era of history for the advanced Dungeons and Dragons game, noting the scarcity of such creatures in the core rulebooks. He includes such classics as the Mammoth, the Ground Sloth, and the Hyenodon, as well as the somewhat lesser-known Zuglodon, kind of slender-bodied whale ancestor, and the Astropotherium, which he described as an unremarkable rhino-sized Miocene mammal. Such were the days. The Aurochs scarcely fares any better. According to Howry, Aurochs are slightly larger and tougher versions of the wild cattle found in the Monster Manual. Aurochs in the real world have only recently become extinct in the 17th century in Europe, once living in temperate forests and meadows. Aurochs may be domesticated by farmers in some campaigns. Some bulls measured seven feet high at the shoulder, and Aurochs in general were much more fierce and agile than normal cattle. Yep, just slightly improved cattle. No big deal. The fifth edition of D&D didn't help much. Aurochs had to wait to get into the game until Volo's Guide to Monsters was published, and even then, they only made it into Appendix A, where they were lumped under assorted beasts. Sure, there's a story about orcs and riding into battle on one, but you aren't actually told much about what Aurochs really are and what to do with them beyond a stat block and a largely inaccurate and unhelpful illustration. For as far as Howery's initial description went, though, it was reasonably accurate, but it does leave out much of the actual importance of an Aurochs. And yes, that is the singular and plural name for one or many of the beasts. Let's begin with the basics, though. An Aurochs is to cattle what a wolf is to dogs. Similar in many ways, but not the same thing at all. Depending on where you found one, males of the species could be anywhere from 5 to 6 feet tall at the shoulders and weigh more than 1,500 pounds. And here we run into our first problem with understanding the Aurochs and comparing it to modern cattle. We can't. At least we can't based on what we can walk out and see in the typical pastures of today. See, modern cattle have undergone slightly less than 11,000 years of selective breeding, whereby we put two animals together to get a third animal that hopefully exhibits all the best characteristics of its parents. Over the centuries, this has led to a cow that dwarfs its Aurochs ancestor by comparison. Even the smaller breeds of cattle, like your Jersey cow, can go as much as a thousand pounds, with larger breeds like the Belgian Blue hitting 1,400 to 2,500 pounds with ease, while the extraordinary Angus or Hereford can get up to as much as 3,000 pounds. The Italian Kia Nina holds the record for heaviest bull at 3,840 pounds, while a steer bred from a cross between a shorthorn and a Hereford tipped the scales at 4,720 pounds. The Aurochs doesn't hold a candle to the modern breeds of cow. Instead, you have to go back through history to try to find the closest contemporary to the Aurochs among cattle of the day. Even that presents difficulties, though, because while the Oryx did survive until 1627 in Poland, record-keeping on cattle sizes weren't such a much until the mid-18th century at best. However, a few early records from before 1790 indicate that the average size of beef cattle, that is, those intended to produce meat and not milk, average around a mere 350 pounds compared to today's averages. That's a very small cow by today's standards. And records and depictions confirm that cows at the time were shorter, lighter, and more fun-sized. But as the market for meat and milk grew, so too did the cow intended to supply them, with each species introduced to capitalize on specific traits depending on whether they were going to be milkers or provide meat. At the time, our ox would have been larger, taller, and more formidable looking than the average cow. They had long, heavy, tri-curved horns in both the male and female, and therefore required a skull to match in order to support them. 31 inches long and about 8 inches around, the horns sat on wide frontal bones that gave their heads a longer and broader look than the cows. 
Their legs were slender and longer than cows, and in the context of their time, they would have seemed like giants among the cattle. As for that whole much more fierce and agile than cattle bit, written reports and narrative from the time suggest that the aurochs was calm when humans approached unless teased or bothered, but that mating season was generally a time when they became aggressive towards one another, as might be reasonably expected. As a result, aurochs were the ideal targets of domestication, and early man certainly took advantage of that fact. Subsequent scientific study of modern cattle has shown that at least twice in the history of the aurochs, domestication attempts were successfully carried out in two different places, as far back as the Neolithic Revolution, when we began making the shift from nomadic hunter-gatherers to agriculture and settlements. In India, a subspecies of the aurochs was developed called Indusine cattle. These Indusine cattle spread throughout Asia and parts of Africa before eventually dying out sometime before the 13th century but they are the ancestors of the humped cattle we see today, primarily the Brahmin cattle and the Zebu. The other subspecies of aurochs are called taurine cattle, and made their way from the Near East into Europe. They have no hump, and it's from these that the majority of modern cattle come from. The approximately 80 original aurochs that were domesticated in the upper reaches of Mesopotamia are responsible for just about every cow we come across these days. Not only that, DNA studies suggest that the European bison is a crossbreed descended from aurochs and the steppe bison, an extinct species of bison that had a range extending around most of the northern hemisphere. Unfortunately, the aurochs had begun to die out in the southern reaches of its range by at least the 5th century BCE when they were last reported in Greece, and by the 1st century BCE they were gone from the southern Balkans as well. By the 13th century CE, they were still hanging on in places like Poland, Lithuania, and Transylvania, but that range slowly dwindled away as they were still actively hunted, land was increasingly being developed to support farming, and they were susceptible to diseases from regular cattle. As time passed, hunting the aurochs was gradually restricted as the creatures grew rarer, until only royalty in their households could hunt them. Finally, they grew so scarce that even royal hunting was no longer allowed. In Poland, the royal family assigned gamekeepers to the care of the remaining aurochs, exempting these people from taxes in exchange for maintaining open fields to graze in and preventing poaching, which the royal family made punishable by death. It was too little too late though, as by 1564, the only remaining aurochs were a Polish herd numbering just 38 animals. By 1627, the last living aurochs died from natural causes. Frankly, though, we have to be pretty careful saying the aurochs is extinct. For two reasons, both of them relating to genetics, and both of them having to do with each other. See, the aurochs, being the fundamental foundational progenitor of cattle, effectively means that all cattle are a crossbreed, to one degree or another, of aurochs with something else. That means that all cattle share at least some portion of their DNA with aurochs. DNA studies have confirmed this is the case. But interestingly, since aurochs survived for as late into history as they did, this means they were around at the same time and in some of the same places as herds of regular cattle. When this happens, it is entirely possible that they interbred with some of those herds of otherwise distinct cattle in a process described as backcrossing. Effectively, the crossing of a hybrid animal with either a parent or a genetically similar animal to its parent. When this happens, the genes of the pure form, in this case the aurochs, will have moved into the gene pool of one of the earlier hybrids and made them more like the original aurochs than the crossbred species they would have belonged to. Effectively, a new, more pure aurochs form of crossbreed will emerge, resulting in a new subspecies which is exactly what researchers have discovered happened in parts of Britain during the Bronze Age. Indigenous populations of British and Irish cattle DNA was compared against DNA recovered from a 6,700-year-old aurochs bone, and the results showed that traditional cattle breeds from Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and England, for example the Highland, Dexter, and Kerry breeds, had DNA more similar to the aurochs than to other populations of cattle meaning that the aurochs continues to live on to some extent in these breeds. Which makes a bunch of other researchers, scientists, and interested people very happy, because they've been trying to bring back the aurochs in one form or another 
since at least the 19th century, usually by careful crossbreeding. By 1920, the Heck brothers had attempted to breed an Aurochs lookalike species in Germany. They met with modest but disputed success on the grounds that no one was really sure exactly what an Aurochs was meant to look like, so how could they know for sure if it worked or not? The resulting species, called Heck cattle, still exists, but has now agreed to bear little actual resemblance to the original Aurochs. But the genetic call still sings out to various groups interested in reintroducing the Aurochs to its former habitats, and the confirmation that certain breeds are more Aurochs than other breeds helps them locate the genetic material needed to effectively reconstruct them not only with the right look, but with the right behaviors to fit back into their wild habitats. Projects in Germany, Latvia, and Hungary continue to this day under the Taurus Project banner, with a focus especially on correcting the defects of the earlier Heck attempt. Other projects are attempting to achieve success by genetic editing, or, as in Poland, by extracting and rebuilding DNA from actual Aurochs fossils currently residing in museums around the world. One project, the Dutch-based Taurus program, is attempting to bring the Aurochs back by sequencing the DNA of known primitive breeds of cattle that already resemble Aurochs in many of their features. The current estimate for that program's success is seven generations of breeding. Sometime around 2025, they figure. Undoubtedly, they will be greatly helped by L1 Dominant 01449. L1 Dominant has a unique distinction. In 2009, she became the first domesticated livestock animal to have its genome sequenced. A Hereford cow. You've been listening to GM Word of the Week, where we're having a hard time believing that it's nearly June already. How did that happen? We hope you and yours are continuing to do well and making the best of things that you can. Hopefully you're in a place where you can get outside and do things in the fresh air for a bit. If not, it's okay to wistfully stare out the window and sigh heavily. No one is going to hold it against you. Stay strong and stay safe. Did we mention this episode is the lead-in to another of a small series of connected episodes? No? Well, we probably should at some point. A great big thanks to Dwemthy, who not only spells their name in a difficult manner, but went out and wrote us a review on Podcast Republic. And an additional slice of thanks to Hege124 from Sweden as well, though we've probably mispronounced that, and we think we missed their earlier review on Apple Podcasts up until now. It's hard to keep track of all the places to look, but if we can find them, we will. So go ahead and rate and review the show, and we'll do our best to call you out in a future episode. If you'd like to help support the show and keep it ad-free at the same time while also getting a bonus or two along the way, then head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com and click the yellow banner at the top. That's also a great place to find back episodes, subscribe to the show feed, and connect up on either Spotify or Apple Podcasts. You can even send us a message from there if you'd like to. We don't mind. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who hasn't got a beef with anyone. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions, as fine a batch of itty-bitty pretty ditties as you'll find. The cow is of the bovine ilk. One end is moo, the other milk.